Testing one, two. Can you hear? Okay. And then we'll begin with the three sounds of the bell. We can just come back to our breathing, come back to our body. And if you like, you can touch gratitude to have to have a sangha, <laughs> to be able to to practice together as one sangha body uh, in a physical space together. And uh, yeah, and especially to have a chance to to have so many uh, members of the order of interbeing here and future members. What it needs. Um, yeah, I know the monks and nuns, we are very happy to have you here because it's been a long pandemic and it's still going on. But I, I personally touch a lot of gratitude in every moment uh, for, for the vaccine <laughs> and for that allows us to, to be here together and many other conditions. So we can touch our gratitude as we listen to the sound of the bell. Dear respected Thai, dear noble community, um, so today is the 23rd of June in the year 2021, and we're in the Ocean of Peace Meditation Hall at Deer Park Monastery. And um, so during the pandemic, I've been teaching a course on the 40 tenets of Plum Village. And um, yeah, this is, I think, the largest number of people that have been in that class, at least physically, <laughs> because it's just been uh, some of uh, our sisters and brothers here. Um, and many of them have, hadn't had a chance to study directly with Thai. And so um, uh, one brother asked me if I would go into these teachings which Tai gave in I think I think the first teachings were in 2005 and then it continued in 2006 and 2007 we were studying the uh, mainstream schools of Buddhism traditionally there are 18 mainstream schools of Buddhism that um, were flourishing in the uh, from the beginning of the Common Era until uh, four or five hundred years later, or um, kind of just a rough, est rough, rough uh, uh, estimate. And uh, these schools had many different teachings, 
And so Tai took, a, I think, at least two winter retreats to go into all the, the different teachings that had arisen. Um, of course, in the core, they were mostly the same, but they each had particular particularities. Um, one very famous school is the Sarvastivada school, um, which, for example, uh, had the understanding of impermanence that uh, phenomena exist, uh, uh, really exist in the past, also in the present, and then in the future. <laughs> and so that's why they're called Sarva Asti, it means always being, <laughs> whether in the past, present, or future. Um, and there are various reasons why they came to that understanding. And, um, there was another school called the Pud Pudgalavada, which thought there's no self, but there's a person. <laughs> so these, these kind of things um, came up in these different schools. And so Tai went through those schools uh, one by one, uh, and then Tai asked the question, so where does Plum Village fit in these schools? What have we learned? in the Plum Village tradition. And so that went on to be this core teaching on what uh, Tai, through his own practice and understanding, had learned uh, in, in 60 or so years as a monk at that time. And, uh, and also what we collectively had learned in Plum Village. So as you know, Plum Village is not about just one teacher. The Thai is uh, our root teacher, but it's also about all of our our own experience and insight that we bring to it. And so it's in a in Plum Village is we can say an explicitly evolving tradition. So in just like a a river, it's not like we are fragmented. Right? There is a continuity. So the river is changing, but it uh, is somehow has a sense of continuity as well. And I think that's why I was particularly attracted to this tradition. <laughs> and because if we look into the history of Buddhism, we see that Buddhism is not just one thing, but it has also evolved. And so Tai talked about uh, evolving Dharma. <laughs> So the Dhamma helps us to touch the unconditioned in ourselves, not out there. <laughs> we touch it everywhere. But the, the nature of the Dhamma can evolve according to the situations that present itself in, in the world, in society, and so uh, in a maybe largely agrarian society, certain aspects of teaching the Dhamma are more prominent than others in like a post-industrial society <laughs> uh, like we find ourselves in now. And <clears throat> we have to be very skillful and very honest in our practice in looking into how we can incorporate insights that come from um, our own time into the Dhamma so that they can help people to touch the unconditioned. And so this 40 tenets for me are um, ties deep looking into the tradition and recognizing how it has evolved and how it's continuing to evolve. And they are not set in stone. They are based on Thay's insight at that time. And hopefully if, as we continue to go into them, we, we help to <laughs> evolve the Dhamma. <laughs> And there are always aspects um, of um, any tradition as it grows and continues to flow that um, 
end up being a kind of dead end, right? Like you, <laughs> the water goes off, but it, it doesn't really go anywhere. It just goes into a little inlet and then it ends up coming back to the main river. And so we also need to recognize um, that, that uh, our conditioning uh, can, if we're not careful and we really are honest with our, the fruit of our practice, it can also lead us into more conditioning. <laughs> so that is, uh, that is uh, the beauty of the evolving Dhamma. Is that it, uh, yeah. Like we know in the, using the example of evolution of living beings on the planet Earth, that there have been uh, many living beings. I was just looking at a, an image of a trilobite. I don't know if you've seen a fossil of a trilobite. It kind of looks like a, um, uh, uh, a horseshoe crab. Has everyone seen a horseshoe crab? It's a, I grew up near in New England, we have them, you know, when you go to the beach. And I, I don't, I've not seen them here in Southern California. Yeah, but they are um, quite similar to a trilobite. They, they have kind of a, they look like this. And then they have a, a little part here and a long, uh, sharp thing. And then underneath they have their feet. This is kind of a shell. And actually, the eyes are here, so this is their tail. But usually when people find it, they think this is the head. When I was a kid, I used to think this is the front, because <laughs> it kind of looks like, this looks like the front of a crab, but actually, its eyes are right here. And it just kind of walks along in the shallow water. And basically, this animal, as I understand it, has more or less been the same for 350 million years. <laughs> The horseshoe crab, and so not quite to the time of the trilobites, but it's it's and it kind of moves along, and I think it sometimes it goes onto the beach. I'm not sure if it's because it has to lay its eggs in on the land. Um, does anybody know? <laughs> anyway, so I was looking at a fossil of a trilobite, and of course there are no trilobites today. There's only something a little bit like a trilobite. And so it's a kind of evolutionary path that for whatever reason flourished enormously for a certain amount of certain many millions of years, tens of millions of years. But then for some reason, environmental, climatic, um, or, or other that we don't know, disappeared. <laughs> and so similarly with the Dhamma, we can see that there are, certainly in our time, there will be forms of the Dhamma that will be extremely popular, like the past, the past 20 years, mindfulness is an aspect of the Dhamma that has become extremely popular. But if you look back into, say, 7th, 8th century China, it was like insight, prajna, which everyone was trying to get, like, how can I get prajna? And that was much more prominent. And so when you read like the, the Platform Sutra, you, you see a lot about prajna, insight, and Samadhi, but now we, we are more interested in mindfulness. So it's a bit like that in the Buddhist uh, river, that sometimes there are things that just meet a certain need in the society that are become much more prominent. And, uh, but we don't know, maybe, I don't think, I'm not, if you take mindfulness out of the Buddhist tradition, I'm not, I don't think it can still be the <laughs> Buddhism. <laughs> but uh, um, it's just to give an example, there can be something that becomes very, very um, I I integral to Buddhist communities. And we don't even know, we don't even realize that it's, we all take it for granted, you know, as we, as we practice. And then, but somehow, then it just dies out. And then 50 years later, people say, oh, you know, back in that time in Deer Park, and they're always talking about I don't know, I'm trying to think of something. The, the 10 mindful movements, remember we were always doing those 10 mindful movements? I was just talking to my sisters this morning and I said, Why you, we don't do the mindful movements during walking meditation at Deer Park. I, I tried this spring to, to get it back into the program. <laughs> it's 
So I said, you know, in Plum Village, Thai love to stop and just maybe Thai did it or another brother or sister or sometimes Thai gave a long Dhamma talk and we recognize, oh, people's knees are hurting and oh gosh, you know, why don't we stand up and do the 10 mindful movements? But I noticed, I've been in Deer Park since last August. Nobody has done the mindful movements. <laughs> And so I don't know, will the mindful movements like be uh, like the trilobites? And they just kind of, this thing that we spend a lot of, you remember when we used to do the 10 mindful movements all the time? And then, you know, we just have like, a, we, somebody surfaces an old DVD of Thai doing the movements and they think, oh yeah, it's like a fossil. And it's been buried, gosh, we forgot that we did. I like to do them, so I, I'm, part of the reason I'm saying this is that maybe we can keep doing them, but... <laughs> Not everybody, for some reason, likes the ten mindful movements. So that's the nature of evolving Dhamma. Is it? And there are some things like the horseshoe crabs, which are just so well designed for their environment that they just quietly continue for 350 million years. It's incredible. Huh? <laughs> so the, hopefully there are some aspects of the Dhamma like that. The Dhamma is the, of the Shakyamuni Buddha has been here for 2,600 years. So hopefully there are some aspects <laughs> that are like horseshoe crabs that quietly, inconspicuously continue their, their wonderful, natural way. <laughs> so it's a topic that I, I remember when I was a novice and Tai talked about evolving Dhamma. I was like, wow, that's so cool. But now I see it. The longer we're in the community, we see. And uh, you should remember that uh, this evolving Dhamma helps us to, to practice patience. And sometimes evolution takes time. And um, yeah, we, Tai always talked about, we, we, within all of us, there is the progressive and there's also the conservative. <laughs> Even we consider ourselves the most progressive of the progressive of the progressive, but we still have, like, almost the fact that we consider ourselves the most progressive of the progressive makes us conservative. <laughs> right? <laughs> So, so that, that is not a, about politics, but that's actually the nature of evolution. The reason we're still here is there's some conservation. <laughs> we don't, yeah, if there's a mutation, it doesn't, if there's a mutation which is too radical, then we and like some people have uh, pass on gen uh, genetic diseases in their family and that you know goes on, and now because of modern science, we can find ways to treat them. But um, in the past, they would have just that lineage might have died out. You know, a famous uh, example is the you know the royal families in in Europe that were constantly intermarrying and uh, very closely, and then caused a lot of um, uh, congenital or genetic diseases to then manifest more prominently. So anyway, it's a little bit about evolution <laughs> in the Dhamma. So we should recognize that that conservative element sometimes has a positive aspect <laughs> because just like the horseshoe crab, it's, it's quietly keeping and maintaining itself over many, many tens of hundreds of millions of years. Um, so evolving Dhamma, but also there's a continuity. That's the beauty of our... I, I, I don't know that every Buddhist tradition looks at themselves in that way, but we, as a Plum Village tradition, we consciously look at ourselves as part of a living tradition that is evolving. Um, I always tell my young, younger brothers, like when they get very passionate about a particular thing, because that always happens. There's always new things coming in, and that's the beauty of the tradition. We have many young monastics in our community, and they bring in so many wonderful um, new things that they've learned that have been important for them in their, in their spiritual path. And that there's a tendency to want the community to reflect their, uh, their point of view as quickly as possible. 
<laughs> which is very normal, right? Because that's what's meaningful for you and it's what's touched you and that's the community from which you have come and what's, which inspires you. And I always say, well, just, just stay around for a few years. <laughs> I saw so many brothers, they, they left, the, and then like just a year later, or the two, two years later, exactly the thing they were most passionate about, just manifest. It's just there weren't enough conditions yet. And then boom, two years later, three years later, we have an organic farm in Plum Village, and people living there, growing organic food for the community. And I watched many of, a few of my brothers like leave the Sangha because they were so impatient that we didn't start an organic farm so it's just an example. We, if we see the nature, the evolving nature of the Dhamma, then we can have a lot of patience. And we know that uh, with our good intention and our experience that we contribute to the Sangha, that it will continue to evolve. The Sangha is always listening and learning and seeing how to adjust and grow. Okay, so that's the story of horseshoe crabs. And this is, these 40 tenants are a beautiful example of evolving Dhamma. And we can listen to a sound of the bell. So we're on the eleventh tenet. Mindfulness. Concentration. and insight. Are the essential practices. that give rise to liberation. So you can see on the <laughs> thin glass window, smriti, samadhi, prajna. So these are the uh, three, these three uh, trainings are the pillar of Plum Village practice. And if you look in many of the traditional texts, you'll see, you'll s instead of smriti, you'll see shila, samadhi, prajna. So shila is uh, precepts, but we, translate it as uh, mindfulness trainings. Because Thay had the insight as a young monk. He said, why do we have to practice precepts in order to get the liberation? <laughs> and then he had the insight that actually precepts are mindfulness. They are not separate. When we are mindful of uh, the effect of our actions on ourselves and on others, then we naturally behave in a way that is um, <coughs> harmonious and 
kind rather than <laughs> aggressive, violent, uh, uh, impolite, and, and so forth. <coughs> and so, and you saw that in the uh, core Buddhist teachings, in the heart of the Buddhist teachings, you have the five faculties and the five powers, and they both include smriti, samadhi, and prajna. So you have uh, um, sh uh, shraddha, virya, smriti, samadhi, prajna. So faith, diligence, mindfulness, concentration, and insight. And so he had the realization that uh, in, 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 in the heart of the Buddhist teachings, there is smriti, samadhi, prajna appearing many times. And then these three trainings, which are Shila Samadhi Prajna. <laughs> and that's when he put the two together and had the insight that mindfulness are the mindfulness trainings. And that's where the name mindfulness trainings actually come from. So Tai uh, saw that the word precepts in English is maybe not so inspiring. <laughs> and so... Uh, yeah, rather than call them precepts, you see that these are trainings which cultivate mindfulness. And mindfulness is um, something that is uh, uh, what he calls a taintless. All three of these trainings are um, in Sanskrit, an asrava. So we can translate it as um, taintless or um, uh, not leaking, <laughs> not leaking. Because uh, shrewd, the root of this word, which here becomes shra, Shrav, shrava, is uh, to flow. And an is, uh, uh, means not flowing. So in the sense that uh, when we are overwhelmed by uh, desire or um, um, desire for sensual pleasures, desire to be somebody, desire not to be somebody, <laughs> um, then we, we we lose our balance. We lose our solidity. It's like we're, we're leaking. <laughs> the thing is, something uh, like a if you, if you have a balloon, right, and you're holding it, and it's very nice and buoyant, but then you put a little hole in it, and it starts <laughs> going <laughs> all around, right? So it's a little bit like that. It's not so stable anymore, erratic, and so mindfulness is has the quality of and we can never get too much mindfulness. <laughs> it, is, it is a quality that we, as we cultivate and it will not lead to leaking. <laughs> so the more mindfulness, uh, then you're aware of the leaking that's going on in terms of what you're taking in through your eyes, your ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. It's interesting, this uh, phrase, asrava, is very ancient. It goes back to the earliest Buddhist teachings. And it's not only in the Buddhist tradition, but also in the Jain tradition. What's in modern times called the Jain tradition, which was one of the uh, Samana movements the time of the Buddha. So there were many, um, like Indian, a bit of Indian history in a nutshell. So you had these Brahmanical uh, ritualists uh, who were in the, mainly around the LA area of like Delhi now, spreading eastward and coming into contact with many tribal peoples in the <coughs> more eastern part of the Gangetic Plain that 
uh, had relatively egalitarian societies. And so at that time, time of um, the Shakyamuni Buddha, these uh, societies are starting to trade more amongst them. So business is becoming a more prominent occupation. And some of these small tribal societies uh, are coming together into larger kingdoms. And, and so um, as these uh, 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 peoples came into contact with the Brahmanical teachings, many of them could not accept the uh, tradition that came along with that, which included animal sacrifice in order to generate merit, um, and also uh, usually a very, what had becoming an ossified class or caste system, right, with a, a warrior ca class and a Brahmanical class, and then merchants and all others below them, and farmers and so forth. And so going from a more egalitarian society to this kind of os more ossified, you know, uh, class-based Brahmana, the Brahmins, who are the spiritual ritualists, and then the, the Kshatriyas, who are the warriors, who then defend the country, and then all the merchants, and then farmers, and so forth, um, and even slaves who are were not part of any caste. Or, um, and so uh, this Samana movement arose uh, somewhat um, in response to that situation, and... Um, and so the many young men and many, very few, unfortunately, young women <laughs> went, went on the spiritual path by leaving home and trying it out, like experimenting in, in themselves in the forest, you know, not having a family, not deciding on a career, or being a householder, and uh, trying to understand their mind. And many teachers came up so these were outside of this Brahmanical tradition. They, so they, it's called the Samana movement. And so the Buddha saw one of these um, wandering monks or Samanas, and that inspired him to leave home, to leave behind his family and his uh, wife and only child and... and uh, and go forth and then try to live, like eat roots. He tried living you know, by eating uh, roots and fruits that were found in the wild, in the forest. And um, kind of, sometimes he felt himself like a deer looking from the wild into the human civilization. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Sometimes when I was backpacking for many days and then I would, you know, I, I did a few times in Vermont in that area and I would, suddenly come on a house or something and with a nice garden, you feel like this is the way the deer sees <laughs> human beings. <laughs> Everything looks so civilized after this wild, free you know, life in, in the forest. So the Buddha tried these kinds of practices as well in his early um, path as a samana and then went to a number of spiritual communities and learned from those teachers. And one of the prominent contemporaries of the Buddha who um, was a, a teacher named Mahavira. And so he is considered um, one of a succession of um, what they call jinas, like conquerors. That's why you get the word jain. It means the one who is uh, of the conquerors. And they had that they had, for example, the five precepts, not to kill, not to steal, not to uh, engage in sexual misconduct, not to lie, and not to uh, drink alcohol or intoxicants. And so the Buddha actually learned from, so those, those precepts were not um, like just invented out of the blue by the Buddha, but he, he saw that they were good and he inc incorporated them into his teachings. And so those were already teachings that, that were um, largely risen up in the Jain community, as far as we can tell. And, and asrava is also a term that the Jains uh, used slightly differently 
they translated it as an inflow, <laughs> whereas the Buddhists saw it as an outflow, like a leaking. But in the Jain sense, you have the, because they talk about an Atman or a self, and so it's like these contaminants that are coming in and sticking to the self. They, they, like, they, they encumber you, and they kind of stick, your stickiness. Um, but of course, the Buddha had the insight of no self, that everything inter is. And so in the Buddhist tradition, it's uh, thought of a little bit differently as uh, uh, things that are leaking out, like uh, our desire, our, our anger. Um, so it can be a synonym for klesha, afflictions. Usually, we, so far in this class, we've talked about klesha. Sorry, in this, in this class, I use more Sanskrit terms, just for fun. <laughs> Not too many, but <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it, you know, Sanskrit was, became the lingua franca of uh, India, and uh, the main kind of, along with Pali, uh, in, which is very related, closely related to Sanskrit. So these terms are kind of quite core. So I try not to use ones that are excessive. But just a little bit is <laughs> also nice. So klesha is a term which came to be used in the Buddhist tradition to mean afflictions. And so asrava and klesha are, are related. Yeah. Sometimes there are different layers of the tradition which are coming from different areas. The asrava is very, quite ancient in the tradition. And um, klesha, when we get into the Abhidharma teachings of Buddhism, which kind of broke all of reality down to atomic particles that could be described according to the Buddhist teaching, then uh, you see much more often klesha. But in the early uh, texts we have, it, it, we still see asrava, but klesha is, is, tends to talk about, uh, more frequently about afflictions. So asrava is a sense of like uh, leaking and that comes from us not being happy where we are. <laughs> like not learning how to dwell happily in the present moment. So we see that calligraphy of Thai, you already have enough. And so that is to practice the practice of anasrava. You don't need to keep getting that and that and ordering this on Amazon and <laughs> you know, watching that movie or getting that book or becoming part of that movement or you know. You can do those things but there's a way to do it without leaking, without this, this uh, uh, want, wanting to get something. You're not, you're not, you're not uh, uh, yeah, trying to to get something out of a situation, but you bring your happiness and your joy to every situation. Somehow we, we re we're very sensitive as human beings. We know when somebody's trying to get something. They're not telling us, they're like, mm, what does she want? What does he want? <laughs> we feel this kind of stickiness. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because we're a good practitioner, we, we don't say, mm, I don't say what I want. But we feel something, <laughs> want something. So that's, that's the kind of asrava. And it can be very strong. You know, if, we, if we really um, are feeding our desires every day, then it becomes so strong that it's like a big oak tree. You can't easily move it. <laughs> you can't uproot it very easily because it's so conditioned by our consumption what we consume through our eyes and ears and tongue and, and so forth. But uh, yeah, I try to look every day and see, mm, you know, why, why do I want to go do that? Or like, what do I want to do that? Or especially lately, I've been looking and seeing, I'll be walking from one activity to another and I'm thinking about, oh, you know, when I get back to my bed, I've got that really good book to read. That's so interesting, you know. And I'm like, oh, but I'm really stopping and saying, wait, I'm not enjoying my step. I'm just already, my mind is already in my bed, taking a nap, reading my book. And 
here I am in Deer Park Monastery, and many people want to come here and just stand here where, where I'm standing right now and enjoy the sound of the birds, the beauty of the blue sky, the mountain. And all I'm thinking about is this book. And, you know, somebody could be ordering that book on Amazon but be at their home and just thinking about, oh, I wish I could just be standing in the parking lot behind the dining hall of Deer Park Monastery. <laughs> you see, it's a bit silly, but that's the way we, you know, that's the way our mind works. And so I've been learning lately, ah, that's an, that's an asrava, that's a leak. <laughs> I'm leaking. <laughs> Somehow I'm not fully with my step. I'm not fully with my body. And so there's still something that's looking for the next thing and the next thing, <laughs> always the next thing. And then if I don't, if there's not a bunch, like if I have a lot of meetings or, um, you know, something not, I consider not so pleasant coming, then I just, mm, uh, just got to get through it, just plow through it, and then there'll be happiness on the other side. Just, I'll be able to take a nap after lunch. <laughs> you know, so that, that's, I'm exaggerating a bit, but this is kind of what I notice in my mind. Sometimes that thought comes up, like I can't, there's something that doesn't completely tolerate the present moment and is looking for succor or some, something that will uh, resolve my suffering in the future. And that's asrava, that's a leak. <laughs> And then you just recognize it. You don't get angry at it, but you say, oh, I'm leaking a little bit. <laughs> and then mindfulness, the beauty of it, and why Tai talks about it with, with regard to this tenet, is that these three um, qualities, they help to uh, stop the leak. So as we cultivate mindfulness, we become aware of the ways in which we are that mind of always trying to find happiness somewhere in the future is leaking into our consciousness and driving us onward always to the next thing. <laughs> so it's causing us to run. But in this, with this metaphor, we don't talk about running necessarily, but leaking. We're, we're leaking a little bit. It's just like a faucet that's a little bit open like I noticed outside our tea house at the brothers, that we have some irrigation hoses and one of them has been leaking. And I was thinking, oh gosh, like how many buckets of water after many days from that one little leak. And we just came back from a camping trip in uh, Arizona. And on the way back, I, well on the way over, but also on the way back, we crossed the Colorado River and I'm very fascinated by this river um, because it provides water to so many people <laughs> in, this, in this area of the country. And it's been the subject of so much intrigue and real like nasty water rights fighting over the past few centuries. And, um, and then noticing that the Colorado River is smaller we, we, when we drove out, we drove out on the northern route. So, um, I forget the name of the town, but it was more to the north. And then on the way back, I, we came back along the Mexican border. And I noticed that the Colorado River is smaller <laughs> next to the Mexican border than it was farther north. <laughs> and so I was thinking about the, the leaking. <laughs> Colorado River, all the water that is being siphoned off because of our, our constant need for this precious resource, uh, water. So in the same way, our mind can, can leak like that. And with mindfulness, we become aware of it and we see, ah, I need to stop maybe that nutriment that is causing me to leak. <laughs> to think that my happiness is somewhere else in the future. Like, what is it that, that says, oh, okay, well, maybe something in that book, why does reading that book bring me pleasure? That's why I ask myself, oh, there's something that reminds me of this, that, or that 
something happy that happened to me when I was a child. And so, or maybe it's just I like being kind of snuggled up in my bed with a blanket and nobody's bothering me or asking me to do anything, like teach a 40 tenets class. And I can just enjoy reading this book, you know, and nobody's going to bother me because Brother Minim is my roommate and he's so lovely. He's just quiet and in the corner and I can just lay there and read my book. And so whatever it might be, it might not be the book, it might be the situation. There's something that's kind of drawing us there and we not really totally dwelling happily in the present moment. So that's the, the practice of mindfulness of the leek and why we call this, uh, these three trainings the, the three taintless trainings. Or we could call them the three non-leaking trainings. <laughs> So uh, Tai taught us that there's a kind of synchronicity which happens when we cultivate mindfulness in every cell in our body. It's not that just one cell is mindful or just our like lung cells are mindful or our brain cells are mindful or our intestine, cells in our intestine are mindful, but there's a kind of synchronicity that happens. And so it's, it, it, there's a sense of unity rather than fragmentation or differentiation. So that's why we, there's a very strong feeling when we cultivate mindfulness of that you know, one is in all and all is in the one, as they say in the Avatamsaka Sutra, the sense of oneness, that we can see the whole universe within our very body. Now we know that is true scientifically <laughs> because the elements in our body are made of the supernova of stars. And just as the earth beneath our feet and the air and so forth, all these heavier elements. Mm. You know, the, the, there are, I think, only a few, I can't remember the number, but it's a very small number of what they call non-metallic stars still existing in the Milky Way galaxy. It means that they are mainly uh, hydrogen and helium. But most of the stars are not uh, uh, like original stars from the Big Bang, but they're actually uh, sec second or third generation. <laughs> so there's been a supernova, which has caused, is necessary for heavier elements like oxygen and all the way up to iron um, and so forth to be generated to be by this massive explosive force of a supernova. And then that gaseous ma matter is then pulled together by gravity and then forms a new star. And so you have metal in those later generation stars. And we can look at the spectrum of the stars and, and be able to tell that. Um, that's how we know, you know <laughs> a little bit about how these heavier elements that make up our body have come about. So we can know that scientifically, but the experience of it, to really feel it, needs mindfulness. It needs that, uh, this, this capacity to 
bring awareness to what is going on in the present moment within us and around us that creates a sense of to togetherness somehow, that these cells in our body are operating as one. That is a, the, the beautiful experience of mindfulness. And when, when we do that, when we cultivate that, then there's concentration the way. So these, are, these uh, three are interrelated. And concentration also leads to mindfulness. So concentration means uh, it's a kind of uh, s mindfulness um, has uh, is uh, it kept over time and synchronous throughout the body. So all of our cells, we bring them online. So they described it like an electric current. <laughs> They, they can say like a computer cannot uh, come alive without the electric current. And so the same thing is true of our body. If we don't, if we're not cultivating awareness, cultivating mindfulness, then it's like we're, we're the walking dead. <laughs> I find it so fascinating that in the popular culture that zombies are, have become so prominent. Isn't that a strange thing? Is it, what does that have to say about our culture? That, you know, we, we, I, I just, when I go to New York City or I go to a big city and I see people walking around, and, I mean, I guess it's because we look around and we see, oh, these people are walking like zombies. Maybe none of them are really, are they like, are really alive? Maybe I'm the only one who's really alive and everyone's a zombie. <laughs> Did you ever have that thought? No, okay. <laughs> That's the kind of thought I think I had as a 13-year-old thir kid. You're like, oh gosh, you know, what is, you know. <laughs> anyway, so we can be like zombies without that the electric current of mindfulness bringing ourselves alive. And um, and the beauty is that um, we see that that's enough. With more mindfulness practice, you see you already have enough. So you don't continue to leak so much because you realize your happiness is, is not going to come from that thing that you want. You might get a bit of pleasure for a little bit of time, but it's not going to bring you lasting happiness that's very solid and secure. And that's what keeps bringing us back here to Deer Park, I, I think. <laughs> that's what keeps me as a monk, <laughs> is, is recognizing, keep, keeping to see like, oh gosh, there's another conditioned thing that I've been relying on for all these years, and then when it's taken away, I feel, oh, gosh, I'm devastated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you ever, like, as a, I find as a mindfulness practitioner that, you know, at, at the beginning, we kind of get healing, and we continue to get healing, but there's a lot of joy. I mean, my first retreats were just like, I was walking in heaven, this is like, this is exactly what I've been looking for my whole life. And wow, I'm going to get enlightenment. And <laughs> no, I, I didn't really think that, but I thought, at least I'm going to suffer less. <laughs> you know, I, I was just hoping that I can get stronger mindfulness so I don't continue to have so much suffering. And, uh, but then, yeah, actually, I discovered that with more mindfulness, I discovered all kinds of suffering I didn't know I had. <laughs> Beyond the ones that I <laughs> that brought me to <laughs> the practice center, yeah, and so and then I, I I'm always still uncovering new ones, <laughs> new habit energies, and then when I talk to my parents, I say, oh gosh, yeah, I have that too, <laughs> you know, that's in me. <laughs> I do that too. <laughs> I mean, now I just it's like it's like it's so quick that it happens. I don't. I used to criticize when I was like maybe many of us. Uh, my parents when I was younger, in my early 20s, but now I just, right away, it's like, oh, I do that too. Yep, I do that too. <laughs> and so I put it in, you know, I see that there are things that I haven't recognized that I also do in myself. My, it's funny how other people can see it more clearly. My brothers here, like one of my brothers came up, Brother Fabu came up to me and said, you're so like your dad. I'm like, oh, God. 
I mean, after 17 years of mindfulness practice, I'm, st you, you still <laughs> I'm still like my dad, okay. So that wasn't the point, was to not become my dad. No, I, of course not. <laughs> so somehow, um, yeah, there's, there's always things that I continue to discover that, um, yeah, they are contributing to my solidity and my stability. A recent one for me was coming here to Deer Park because I've been living in Plum Village for 11 years straight. And I see that, wow, it really became my home. You know, when I drove up the hill to Upper Hamlet, it was like, it felt like when I was a kid driving up the hill to my home that I grew up in, in my hometown. Like it had reached that point in my consciousness where it was just in, in, uh, beautiful, but in some ways it's like a, such a mundane thing that just driving up the hill to Plum Village, which would be for some people like a once in a lifetime thing, was for me just like driving home after work. And, and, uh, and so coming here last fall to Deer Park and then in the middle of the pandemic, and um, I, I noticed that, wow, there's some things that I've really gotten, I've, I've created habits in Plum Village in my way of relating to my brothers and the community and the way of, of doing things in the Sangha which don't really apply and they don't really work here in Deer Park because <laughs> this is a much smaller community and it's a different culture and, and so I, I yeah, oh gosh I turned off that's my aunt and my uncle calling I turned off the notifications. Anyway. Um, so I, uh, I learned that uh, there's some, something in me that uh, I, like things of, about Plum Village, just uh, about the buildings, about the brothers in the community, about the way that we make decisions, about the way we do things, that I had somehow become dependent on. <laughs> and when I didn't see them in the same way here at Deer Park, I said, I would suffer. And I think, oh gosh, here I was even in the monastery and I'm still getting conditioned. <laughs> mm. So I, I didn't get angry like I used to when I was younger in the practice, but I just recognized and said, mm, I'm also a human being and I get attached to things and when they're not there anymore, then I feel a sense of loss, a sense of like, oh gosh, this is gaping hole. <laughs> but only it was, uh, you know, I saw that it's not so big as it was when I was in my 20s or when I was younger, before I started to practice. I noticed that the leak that happens, that kind of allowing myself some sorrow or some sadness is not, is not so big as what as this, the sorrow and the sadness that drove me to the practice. Yeah, so th that's so there's some improvement maybe. <laughs> you have to allow yourself to, <laughs> to see that there's some improvement. Uh, you know, there's some there's some less suffering now. That's uh, the beauty of the practice, and that's um, you know I think that's coming clearly from mindfulness um, and maintaining that mindfulness over time, so allowing it to deepen concentration. It really, it brings a sense of focus and oneness and it lasts over time. So concentration is something that supports us over time. So it's not just an instant of mindfulness, but we're able to maintain it. And uh, and then insight. When our mind is scattered, fragmented, it's difficult to see what's going on. We're like that balloon that's just spinning around <laughs> with a little bit of air leaking out of it. It's, it's quite erratic. But when everything is, when we're mindful, and we're able to maintain that mindfulness over time, concentration, 
then we can see clearly the fruit of our actions in our very body. So this present moment is the fruit of our thinking, our speech, our action that has led us to this point. And that f thinking, that speech and action, the karma, the karma is action, is the fruit also of our parents, our ancestors, our community, family, brothers and sisters, parents, larger culture, things like the color of our skin, um, the uh, religion, all these things have contributed to what we think are, is me, <laughs> which actually is all not me. <laughs> it's all made up of not me elements, right? That's the insight of interbeing. This what I think is me is actually only composed of non-me elements. Just like the flower is made of the sun and the rain and the earth and the sky and so forth coming together with certain conditions. And so that insight that we get from the flower, we can apply to ourself as well. And by doing that, we get the insight that, um, that ex the experience of the present moment is just a process. Yeah, there doesn't have to be a self or a soul or some kind of thing that we r is removed from reality somehow or separate from experience, but that we, just like all phenomena, are uh, uh, like a river flowing, this body, these feelings, these perceptions, and so forth. And, uh, and the beauty is that we can recognize with when we have insight that there's suffering. That's why it's a noble truth. <laughs> you see the suffering and then you can see that this suffering arises due to causes and conditions. So what is it that nourished that suffering? Everything needs nutriment. Nothing can exist without nutriment. So when you see suffering through your insight, you can learn to see its roots in your thinking, in your speech, in your bodily actions. And that then you can change. That's the essence of the practice. <laughs> and um, change how, <laughs> right? So at the beginning, when we're suffering so much, we cannot see clearly how to change. So mindfulness trainings. <laughs> so we say, OK, I see there's a community of people. They know how to dwell happily in the present moment. And this is how they live. What if I try to live like those people? Because we can recognize when somebody's happy. Even as a, a young child can recognize happiness or sadness, anger, these basic emotions. So we ourselves, uh, we can also recognize when there's a happy community. When somebody, we want to be near somebody who has a lot of joy, a lot of happiness. And so when you see people like that, then you, you kind of, you want to be around them, and then you, you say, well, how do they live their life? What, are the, what kind of things do they consume? Edible food, sense impressions, volition, consciousness. What if I also nourish myself with those kinds of edible food, <laughs> you know, sense impressions, and so forth? And that's where we get the mindfulness trainings. So, you're not not acting in violent ways, knowing the suffering that uh, comes about due to violence and killing, knowing the suffering that comes about from stealing, from exploitation, social injustice, and so forth, which is a kind of stealing, knowing the suffering that comes about from sexual misconduct, right? Sexual abuse, um, uh, discrimination of gender, all these things have created so much suffering and continue to create suffering in the present moment. So we can make the determination not to contribute 
to this kind of suffering. Uh, lying, you know, not being truthful is a big suffering. People feel, people rely on us, they trust us, and then when we are not honest, they lose their trust. And intoxicants, you know, alcohol, other kinds of things that um, create addictions, emotional addictions, and also cause us to lose our mindfulness, lose our awareness, so that we say things and do things which then later are hurtful, cause us regret. So this is, these are things, so the mindfulness trainings are not the, like, commandments from God, <laughs> but they're coming from out of community, out of the Samana community at the time of the Buddha, out of, from the Jains, and applied to the Buddhist tradition as well. And so we, we take on those trainings because we want to learn the way of dwelling happily in the present moment and you know, learning ways to stop the leak, <laughs> the leaking from happening. So that's, that's how insight can contribute to our making a change in our life. And then as our insight grows, we're able to see more clearly and more exactly how one thought can lead to suffering. <laughs> one word can lead to suffering. One action <laughs> can lead to suffering. So, the, so there's an element of precision, increased resolution. <laughs> the stronger the mindfulness and concentration, the stronger our resolution. And then we, it's not that the, it's like you take off the training wheels on your bike. <laughs> So the mindfulness trainings are like a training wheel. So it doesn't mean we don't continue to balance the bike, right? That's the misunderstanding. <laughs> People think, oh, I don't have the training wheels anymore, but then they fall down. Because <laughs> they actually haven't learned how to balance the bike yet. But when you know how to balance the bike, and you, it means you've cultivated these three trainings. Mindfulness and concentration are strong, then the insight, the resolution increases and increases, and so you see for yourself, just like the Buddha, and you get the insight, so you see that this is a helpful practice, this is a nourishing practice, and then you can help others to, who still are quite fuzzy, <laughs> you know, and they, they, they're not quite clear what to do, but they know that they're suffering. And have them practice the mindfulness trainings, offer that. <laughs> Say, well, okay, I see you're so happy, you're so joyful. How do you do it? Well, these are some things that I do. And then that gives them, that's a doorway into the Dhamma. But when they know well how to balance the bike, then they can, they don't need to just, uh, I mean, the thing I love about Thai is Thai, uh, thai always includes all s skillful means. He doesn't try to, like get rid of some aspect of the Buddhist teachings or even other teachings like Christian teachings that if he sees that it brings happiness, we can include it. And we don't have to be exclusionary and say, oh no, it's just, just mindful breathing, that's it. Or just this, or just that. But Thay is very inclusive. He wants to bring in everything. And he knows that there are, sometimes it, we, we don't see get the deeper insight yet. And that's not for the sake of being superior. It's for the sake of helping people to see for themselves. Right? And we know that we've all been in the place where we're just suffering so much, we just need something. <laughs> we just need to be around happy people and just borrow the energy. But we also know that that won't last, that we need to cultivate it within ourselves. And that's what the three trainings are there for, to learn how to uh, strengthen our mindfulness. So it's lasting, so that it unifies the fragmentation in our mind through concentration. And we get clear view of what's going on. <laughs> so prajna um, insight is not just intellectual knowledge. It's a direct view into the nature of reality in ourselves and around us. And that's a, um, yeah, that's a, then, then yeah, you, you're like a, you become a professional, um, like Tour de France uh, bike rider. <laughs> you, you can, even somebody 
teaches you and you can still ride your bike. You know, you, 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 you're quite able to balance. Yeah, you, you're not easily upset. You've um, you cultivated anasrava, not leaking. Okay. So we'll finish here. Thank you and welcome for everyone. So for those of us who are online, we, we are just starting our Order of Interbeing retreat. And this is just kind of like a <laughs> confluence of <laughs> our regular Wednesday class and welcoming all of you here. Um, we're so happy to have you here. It feels, I told uh, our br uh, brothers and sisters in the meeting on Sunday that we don't have to do too much. It's, uh, we don't even have to have an orientation because these are, this is our family. <laughs> They know the practice, and they will help us to practice. Well, I didn't say that, but anyway, I, I, th I thought that. <laughs> I always remember in the Plum Village, the 21-day retreats, as a young monk, and just saying, oh, no, I, just, I don't have to. You know, other retreats, you feel like we always have to be fixing this, or dealing with that yelling child, or you know, this person who's very unhappy about this, but then the 21-day retreat and all the OI members come, and we can just like lay back and relax because everybody knows how to practice. <laughs> this is wonderful. We just support each other. <laughs> it's so much easier. It's, and, it, and we benefit. We learn. So thank you for, for coming to join us.